introduction. At Okamex, since her arrival here with her husband Jack in February 2023, she has been remarkably involved at Okamex with the Residence Council, the Oak Leaf, and of course, ILR. We have already benefited from her presentations on the power of myth, her series on Celtic mythology and the Arthurian legend, and also upcoming, we have a special presentation on witches, which I think is on October the 28th. A book of Greek myths got her hooked on myths as a kid, but it wasn't until graduate school that she suddenly discovered myth outside the traditional Greek, Egyptian, North, Norse cluster, and her world exploded when she saw the incredible variety of myths in the world. Nancy has taught at several colleges and universities and lectured for the Smithsonian, Johns Hopkins, and Rhodes Scholar. She was a non-traditional student who didn't graduate from anything until she got a BA after her children were born. She then dashed through an MA in urban planning and returned to the humanities for her PhD. Nancy first became interested in the Hopi myth 50 years ago when they were living just on the edge of the Hopi land. There she learned to love the culture, stories, myths that is, the food, the attitude toward life, and the calm Pacific way of life. Hopi myth, she reminds us, bears no relationship to Indo-European myth uh, we are all familiar with. So that should make it, make it especially interesting, uh, this series. So we look forward to Nancy on Hopi mythology, and here she is. Thank you all for coming out this afternoon. It's good to see so many people here, so many people I know and people I don't know yet. Uh, just before we get started, I need to say there was a misprint in the bulletin. This course will go for six weeks, not five. So our last class will be October 29th, which is very close to our Halloween. And the Hopi do have myths about spirits and ghosts and other scary things, including one of the few tribal myth crossovers from Hopi to Navajo is the story of the skinwalkers. You'll meet them on that last class, I hope not in person. So during the next six weeks, I'm going to take you to a foreign land we will leave the United States and teleport to the Hopi Nation. So a bit of orientation, I think, may be required for many of us. This is a very familiar map, but we're going to be concentrating on that orange egg in the lower left, yeah, lower left-hand corner. The Hopi Nation in gold on this map, is completely surrounded by the Navajo Nation in brown, which in turn is completely surrounded by the United States. The area in green at the bottom, Flagstaff and Winslow, used to be Hopi land, but when the Navajo cut them off from that, it was taken away from them. Really, all the Hopi want and have wanted since time immemorial is to be left alone, to grow their corn, herd their sheep, make their pots, weave their rugs, tell their stories, perform their ceremonies, and most important of all, live in harmony with nature, their deities and spirits, and one another. One of the worst things that can befall a Hopi is to fall out of harmony, to have an argument with someone that's not easily pasted over. 
Like the corn they grow, the Hopi feel rooted to their land. We focused in on the Hopi Reservation, which is comprised of 12 villages. Wait a minute, let me go back a minute. There are three mesas on the Hopi Reservation, labeled first mesa, second mesa, and third mesa. And that's where the villages are. There are 12 cities on these mesas. And a mesa is an isolated flat topped element, ridge or hill, which is bounded on all sides by a steep escarpment, not unlike this podium. So once you're on the top, if you fall off the edge, you're in for a big tumble. Uh, this next slide gives us an overview of the Native American lands that have been parceled out on in Arizona and New Mexico. Then, uh, let's see, where's the dingle? Oops, nope, that's not what I wanted. Okay. Where's the, where's the pointer? Where's the other one? Do you have? It's pointing, but very small, isn't it? See, it's pointing. It's very small. Ah, very I'm small. It is. Okay. Um, the Navajo, obviously, in this picture, is the biggest clump of land of any of them. In fact, several of them put together don't have as many, as much land as the Navajo do. And the Hopi is centered right in the middle, well, kind of to the lower left-hand corner of the Navajo Nation. But the Hopi also are larger than many of the other small settlements. Now, I fell in love with this land, the land of the Hopi, when we were living on the corner of the Navajo Reservation up on the Utah border. not far from Hopi lands. Now, out there on the reservation, there are no fences or landmarks to tell you when you cross from one reservation to another. And with permission, we camped all over this area. No, we didn't have a camper or a pull behind pop-up. We had a two-person tent, some sleeping bags, an array, an array of cooking gear for use over an open fire. I made instant friends with the grandmother of several of our Navajo friends when Jack mentioned to her, just briefly in passing, that I had learned how to make a cake over an open fire. One of my great achievements. Uh, one of the reasons we were allowed to camp here was because after we packed up and left, there was no sign that we had ever been there. When we set up camp, we built a fire, and the first thing we did, oops, okay, there's the mesa. This is the first thing we did, was to build a fire and get out our trusty coffee pot. How many of you have ever cooked with a coffee pot looked like this? Yeah, several, several of us old oldsters. By the time you could smell the coffee, we'd look around and sure enough, there behind one of the boulders, two or three little kids would poke their head up to see what was going on. We hadn't heard them approach. We hadn't heard them there. And if they seen us before a couple of times, they might come down and say hello, or might just come down and look at us and nod, and then they'd leave. And soon after that, a man would come up slowly, carefully, and 
when we suggested he sit, he'd sit. And sometimes he'd accept a cup of coffee, sometimes not. But he'd talk to us a little bit, make sure we understood the unpublished rules of camping on the Navajo or the Hopi, depending on where we were, land, because there weren't any published rules because it was against the law to camp there. But if you were careful and knew what you were doing, it was okay. We spent so much time out there that Jack actually was given a name. He was called the bearded one because in those days, his beard came down almost to his waist and his hair was almost as long in back. He clubbed it back just like a Navajo. I got the much less glamorous name of the bearded one's wife. People back in Page where we were living in a camp town would ask why we went camping out there. And weren't we afraid of the scorpions and the rattlesnakes and being so far away from civilization and a hospital? And our answer was always an unqualified no. We were never afraid out there, not like we'd been in the downtown streets of Washington, D.C. or other big cities at night, much scarier. I fell in love with that land and the people. I loved the pace of getting up in the morning as the sun glinted on the horizon, building a fire, eating, putting the fire to bed for a while and going for a long hike in the mountains. No noise. It is so seldom that we can ever get to a place where there is no noise, no air conditioner running, no airplanes going overhead, no lawnmower cutting the grass, just quiet. Over the years living there, I became curious about the people, the people who had lived there continuously, longer than any other people had lived anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. In spite of, or possibly because of, all the open space out there with the settlements few and far between, the Hopi are a very inward looking people. What do I mean by that? The person who would come and sit by our campfire with us for a while never came back, never invited us to his house, never particularly wanted to be friends. He was just content to know that we were okay to be there, we respected the land, and we weren't going to stay very long. This inward lookingness is clear when we look at a comparison between the Hopi village on the left, several houses all built right up next to each other and on top of each other, and a Navajo Hogan, Ho Hogan uh, on the right side. It's a two person or two persons with children house and you can see for miles just off to the right, there's nothing nearby. You can literally drive for half an hour from one Hogan to the next. The Hopi, on the other hand, are clustered tight together. The Hopi villages of today resemble the cliff, cliff dwellers at Mesa Verde, and I hope Many of you have been fortunate enough to get out there to see it. Uh, I understand today you have to have a guide and there are restrictions. And when we were out there 50 years ago, we just roamed all over the place. I did break down when we took our 18-month-old daughter and get a harness and leash for her because you could fall off the edge in a heartbeat. So you can see the similarities in design. 
between the cliff dwellers and the Hopi. The cliff dwellers were also Pueblo Indians, and that means people who build in a group like this. Much discussion about whether they're related to each other, but one civilization collapsed and the Hopi continued. Hopi families are extended, clan-based, and they need and want to be close to one another. They went when they moved or when the people from Mesa Verde moved in with the Hopi, they went from being protected by the overhanging cliff I don't know whether it shows up well on this slide or not, but the houses were all down well below the cliff top, and that was for protection. It's very hard to get at them because you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, scrambling up from the much lower level below would be difficult and easy to defend against, and anybody trying to climb down would also be in trouble. So this is a, a very old picture, and I'll be talking about it a little bit more later, of a group of Hopi in one of the villages perched on all of the available surfaces of one of their villages. The Hopi are not warlike, and they only fight to protect themselves. They just want to be left alone. Like, was it Marlena Dietrich? I want to be alone. Um, now, the creation story talks about the Hopi wandering from one place to another to find the place that was just right for them. And when they got to their current location, they knew that they were where they needed to be and they never moved again. For those of us, this is a small detour. From those of us who grew up with proselytizing religions, that is, religions who try to convert everyone to that particular faith, or at least are open to having people convert to that faith, for them, the Hopi are an anomaly. The Hopi do not want to convert anyone. They do not want to allow anyone to convert. They do not even want to tell anyone about their sacred beliefs, their deities. They don't want anybody to know about anything they hold sacred unless they were born a Hopi and they have grown and matured enough to have that knowledge. So not even all Hopi have the full knowledge of their belief system. The dances that you can see today on tribal lands are performances, theater. They're not the religious ceremonies that are still guarded as much as possible from outside view. Now, the Hopi are a very polite people. And if you ask them a question about Tawa, one of the deities, for example, it would never occur to them to say, as we hear all too often today, no comment. Instead, they will take a minute or three to think, and then they'll tell you something, but probably something that had already been published based on a conversation between a Hopi and an Anglo 70 years ago. Part of the Hopi politeness took me a while to get used to. In a conversation, words don't bounce back and forth like a ping pong ball. That's what we call conversation today. Instead, the Hopi you're addressing will pause for a moment or three to see whether you have anything else you want to say. Then, after a time to think about what you said, 
they will respond to what you said. These long silences can be very unnerving if you're used to the, of our conversational pattern. Now, in writing this lecture, I suddenly realized that I was using a very Hopi-esque approach to the topic, trying to make sure you understood not only what I was saying, but why I was saying it. With Norse myth, for example, I could just jump right in and say, and then the cow started licking the block and uncovered the two humans who went on to dot, dot, dot. No explanation needed, you can see the image right there. And Norse myth is like that, direct and blunt. Hopi myth is multi-leveled and some aspects are closed, not only to Anglos, but to other Hopi as well. The Hopi's first recorded encounter with Anglos was a very bad one. The Spanish conquistadors and priests. When they arrived, they spent several centuries trying to convert with a variety of tactics, the Hopi to Christianity. After the Spanish left, and I'll talk more about when they left and why later, Anglo settlers tried to penetrate into the Hopi ceremonies and beliefs. Once the camera was available, there was a hidden capture of images possible of images the Hopis did not want available to outsiders. This is the reason so many of the pictures you see on my slide presentation, like this one, are kind of fuzzy and gummy. It's not just that they're old, it's just that the photographer couldn't set up, couldn't use any special equipment, had to get in and get out before he or she was found and ousted physically. Now, I've wrestled with myself over the years because I've taught Hopi myths in other locations about using these images that were taken without permission. But I finally decided that they're out there now, available to anyone, and my using them or not using them will not put them back into Pandora's box. The film that you'll be seeing shortly was made in cooperation with the Hopi, with their cultural preservation segment of the Tribal Council. And the people you see in this film are not professional actors, but Hopi, who have agreed to work with the filmmakers to show that which can be shown to outsiders. So this is not going to be a complete expose of all Hopi belief. Now, the film was originally made in 1983, 40 years ago. So some of the things you'll see have changed over the years. The Hopi are still fighting to preserve a way of life that they see slipping away. But there have been recent changes which are very positive. The language is now taught in schools and taught in adult education classes. The whole section of the, a whole section of the government is devoted to cultural preservation. Now this course will focus on Hopi myth and culture because they are inseparable. For the Hopi, the number four, not three or seven is sacred. Four is a balanced number. It's even, it's paired, like the families, like the cardinal directions, like the number of colors in the ears of corn. Three and seven, most often used in other cultures, are uneven, off balance. The kivas, the sacred spaces are round, 
like the Sipa Puni, which is where the Hopi emerged into the fourth world. The Harpy oral history stretches back thousands of years, and they are believed to have one of the oldest living cultures in the world. This long, uninterrupted span has made the Hopi one of the most studied groups in this hemisphere. Archaeologists have confirmed their presence in the Southwest for thousands of years, possibly longer. The Hopi language has been completely oral until very recently. And if you ever have the courage to try to look at the Hopi dictionary, you will probably understand why. It is one of the most complex languages in the world that is unlike any of the languages you've probably studied, and that includes languages like Chinese. Today, the Hopi use the Western alphabet to transliterate Hopi words so that they can be written down using the Western letters. Now, the Hopi are so grounded where they live that there are three different dialects on the three mesas, and these mesas are not far apart. In fact, uh, the language is so complicated that during World War II, Hopi code talkers, I know we hear more about the Navajo, but the Hopi code talkers were able to baffle the Japanese code breakers just by speaking using their own language. Incomprehensible. I know one person who lived on the reservation for 30 years and spoke the language every day, but said he had never been able to completely master it. And he was now convinced that you had to have been born into it. Just like being born into a clan, you have to be born into the language. Now these dialects that they have on the three different mesas are akin to having three different dialects of English in Gainesville, Newberry, and McCanopy. Because they are so insular, they don't travel. They, you know, they'll trouble when they have to. According to the sorry, Hopi tribal website, which is fascinating uh, if you want to take a look at it, and I'll bring you some links next week along with a vocabulary sheet. No tests, just a vocabulary sheet. Since time immemorial, the Hopi people have lived in Hopi Tutskwana and have maintained our sacred covenant with Masao the ancient caretaker of the earth, to live as peaceful and humble farmers, respectful of the land and its resources. Over the centuries, we have survived as a tribe and to this day have managed to retain our culture, language, and religion, despite influences from the outside world. We invite and encourage you to visit our Hopi lands. However, please be respectful of our laws, our culture, and our way of life. Because the Hopi do not want to share their sacred truths, we have no way of knowing whether the story that was given to someone recently or a long time ago 
is actually what the Hopi believe. In spite of that, we'll move on and, and try to figure it out. All that given, we will talk about what we believe we know about the Hopi and their myth system. Now, Hopi myth is not communicated exclusively with words, but with music, dance, ritual, sand paintings, which you see here, uh, all combined with the verbal to provide a daily holistic approach to the world. Many Hopi get up early in the morning and go and commune with the rising sun. That is one of their ways of establishing harmony in their particular part of the world. One of the central goals of any Hopi is to be in harmony with the universe. Falling out of harmony is a sickness that can be fatal and requires a lengthy cure. Sand paintings, like you see here, can be one type of cure. Of course, the sand paintings that you see here are just like the dances performed in the Pueblos. These are like the sand paintings that are used as part of a curing ceremony, but they're not a copy of them. Unfortunately, our language puts a pejorative spin on words that have been used to describe many facets of the Hopi belief system. Shaman, medicine man, medicine bundle, because many of the causes of illness in the Hopi world are not those recognized by Western medicine. The cures, likewise, are not recognized. The Hopi, as I've said, are very self-contained. They're much more interested in what's happening in their own neck of the woods than across the country or around the world. You're not gonna find a whole stack of newspapers delivered to First Mesa. No interest. The society is matrilocal and matrilineal. That means when a man marries, he moves to his wife's clan, to the house she owns that she inherited from her mother or grandmother. Their children are born into her clan, not his. The house belongs to her. If she decides to divorce him, she simply puts his clothes and other belongings out on the porch. Now, today, there may be more paperwork to be done but the clothes on the front porch would definitely be a message. Clans are made up of individuals who trace their ancestry matrilineally to a common ancestor who is part of that clan's creation story. So each clan does not have the same creation story. Many of the parts are the same, but pieces are different. Clans include more than one family and have developed into many lines of ancestry. Clans are considered to be families, so marriage within one's clan is forbidden. We had two good friends when we were living out there uh, from different tribes, but members of the same clan within that tribe. And when they decided to get married, there was a big hoorah because even though it was different tribes, they were considered to be marrying within the clan. The world of the Hopi is a very colorful one. There are four colors of corn. The world has four points of the compass that each have a color. The ceremonial costumes are bright and colorful. This is a storyteller doll telling stories to the children, again, brightly colored. And these are seven Kachina figures. Kachinas 
except for the clown kachinas, are always brightly colored. The clown kachinas are dressed in black and white stripes and do everything backwards to teach us we need to be able to laugh at ourselves. The kachinas are at once members of the tribe dressed as kachinas, and the spirit of the kachina comes to live within them. You can see in this uh, image in the top left of the official website of the Hopi, the ladder leading up out of the third world into the fourth world, and the logo for the Cultural Preservation Society is with four circles encircled with everything. But, okay, that is the first half of the film, and we will come back to the second half uh, once you've had a chance to digest this first half. Uh, I'd like to ask if there are any questions at this point, anything you'd like to have more information on? Well, Nancy, I'd like to say thank you for an absolutely fascinating lecture and I couldn't help but thinking as I was watching and listening to you that we lost much in our uh, culture by not being more in harmony with the earth seemed to me the message that I got so who's got a question I'll bring the microphone <laughs> tell us about how the girls achieve those hairdos hmm? the hairdos that they have with the oh, butterfly wings. Those are squash blossoms. And that shows that the young girl is not yet married. Once she gets married, she lets her, literally lets her hair down and uh, is, is ready to start moving into the next part of her life. But it's a hairdo that takes two people doing it. One, just her only job is to sit absolutely still and not scream when mother pulls her hair. And the other is the mother who winds it up around. Uh, it may have reminded you of a movie from about 40 years ago. We saw a princess who had a hairdo very much. Princess Leah, yep. Uh, the guy who did those films was fascinated with Western myth and spent a lot of time uh, out in the West gathering myths and listening to people and seeing the old pictures. Um, other question. You stated the that um, the sacredness of life is corn mm -hmm. for the Hopi. How did that come to be? How did corn become the center of their Okay, world? when, according to one creation story, the uh, Hopi emerged out of the third world that was full of corruption. And when they came up into the fourth world, the each of the tribes that came up together, and there were a bunch of them, were offered their choice of corn because that's something that grows really well in that part of the world. And the Hopi, being the very polite people that they are, we're the last to get to choose. Well, the blue corn is almost always smaller and rounder than the other ears of corn, shaped very much like the Hopi themselves, who are short, round, stocky people. Uh, later on in the course, I'll show you a picture of some Hopi and some Navajo standing together. Navajo were tall and skinny, and the Hopi are short and stocky. So that's how they wound up with the blue corn. 
Did that help? <laughs> sort of. Thank you. Since they are such an insular people, how do they their mates if they can't marry within the same clan? Well, the uh, three maces have 12 villages, and each of the villages has several different clans. So they can marry anybody as long as they're not from the same clan. It's like saying, you know, I could marry anybody as long as their last name weren't Montgomery, and Dixon's about as far from Montgomery as you can get. I saw a question up. Yeah, the pictures of the corn that you showed look like modern day hybrid corn. Uh, they didn't really have anything like that that they developed. Yeah. Is that correct? This was, uh, this was filmed uh, in 83, and this is the corn that they were growing then which is the corn that you see hanging up in the pictures, which is the corn they've been growing for, excuse me, for uh, thousands of years. Uh, the corn has never been subject to pesticides, to any of the things that changes and damages our current types of corn, and because they are so, as my grandmother would say, sought in their ways, they don't think, well, now let's see. If we were to try to hybridize the blue corn and the red corn, would we get purple corn? Uh, could we get a striped corn like we have with the, what is it, the oh, sugar and salt? Uh, that idea would just seem like anathema to them. Does that help? Yeah, but that's not primitive corn. I mean, that, that, that corn looks like it's, you know, what we grow today. If you go back and you look at the images from that part of the world that date from, uh, you know, about the time that the... Uh, camera was invented, it looks the same. Uh, if you look at some of the heritage seed products that are grown today, uh, the tomatoes particularly, they look fabulous. Uh, they look strong and healthy, and it's because that's the way nature, I hate to say this, intended them to be. Um, you know, it's when you get in and start mucking about with the gene pool that you can get all sorts of problems. That's just my take. But uh, is corn the basis of their commercial activity? They're wearing Western clothes, and uh, what do they use for money or trade with the outside world? There has been some acculturation. There are people who go off the reservation to teach. There are a lot of people employed by the uh, Hopi Cultural Center and dealing with tourists and giving guides and trying to keep Anglos and other tourists out of sacred spaces. Uh, so there, they do have uh, various means of getting cash, uh, they wear whatever, uh, okay, my mind's going off in two directions now. Uh, they'll wear Western clothes when that seems most appropriate. They'll also wear ceremonial clothes when that seems most appropriate. Uh, because the men are the farmers and out in the fields, uh, having long pants that keep the insects away is a better choice than uh, a short tunic that allows the insects instant access to the entirety of your legs. Does that 
answer your question? I think they may they may sell some of their corn. I'm not too sure of what the economics of it is. I think they probably eat most of the corn that they grow because corn is such a huge part of their diet. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner will feature a corn product of some sort. But that prompts another question. Is corn as this only part of your diet would not be very nutritious? Uh, what? What other things we didn't see anything other than corn? But. No, uh, they they do grow uh, other crops. I think they grow the three sisters in areas where there is water. Are you all familiar with the three sisters? It's corn, squash, and beans, and the corn grows tall and provides a pole for the beans to grow up, and the squash grows around in the shade uh, under the corn fronds. And I can't remember, one of them puts a certain kind of thing back into the soil, and so it's, it's a very complementary growing process. Um, they do eat a lot of beans, uh, both beans that they grow and beans that they import from farther south, from Mexico. Um, they raise sheep, so they have mutton, lamb, um, chickens. Chickens are good for keeping the bugs down, and then they're tasty later. Okay, do we have one more question? Okay, here we are. Well, it's not really a question. I know what the man, the gentleman was saying about the size of the corn. Well, I understand maybe hundreds or thousands of years ago, corn was tiny. It wasn't anything like it. And so, and it came from South America originally, I think, and worked its way north because they had a big trading system with the Indians going back and forth. So by the time the Europeans came, was corn that large or was it still pretty small? I haven't the foggiest. I mean, I know that at some point, because it was well cared for, like anything that's well cared for, it got bigger. Um, and I know what you're talking about with the little itty bitty ears of corn. Uh, but we're talking about evolution over thousands of years. So. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And if you have further questions, you, I know Nancy will be glad to answer them. We're all looking forward to next week's installment. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Stay well. Stay healthy. I want to see you back here next week. <laughs>